Good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's webinar hosted by myself, obviously, uh, on behalf of the National Traction Engine Trust. And it's great to be back, and this is a, another one of our scheduled webinars, hopefully giving you a little bit of a steam fix in this time of absent, absent dues. But I can tell you that uh, there seems to have been a lot of small dues going on around the county. I was very pleased to be at a small steam, steam ploughing do in Cornwall the other day. And I hear that up and down the country, our engines getting out and about, and it's great to hear that. But of course, this is the week where the Great Dorset Steam Fair normally happens. And those of us that, that frequent it uh, are probably missing our friends and times of being together. And some of us, you know, the Guinness, the Guinness stand and the cider shack. But uh, in, in the great words of um, Sir David Frost, hello, good evening, and welcome to Martin Oliver. Martin, it's a delight to have you with us this evening. Evening, Rob. How are you? Well, uh, very, very well, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm missing my old Rosie. I've, I've never really managed to get the handle of that stuff, and I hope I never do. <laughs> but well, if... well. Mine's more special, actually, but uh, yes. Yeah, so well, yeah, well, the, yeah, well, the special, yeah, that, that really mucks me up as well. But, uh, but there you go. But um, tonight is it's just really about you sharing with uh, the folk that are with us tonight. Just something about the Great Dorset Steam Fair. I mean, I think we all have our own memories and views and shares and and adoration of the show. It's 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 the world's biggest event, and. So many of us, you know, go from one year to another, come and join you and uh, lean on your facilities to enjoy our steam fix and, and just to relax a bit. So I know that Dorset Steam Fair has been going for quite some time, but it's a family. It's, it's a bit of a family do, really, isn't it? Well, it is, um, but not just family. Um, obviously, there's a big, strong family connection. A picture there of uh, myself wife and three kids that's that's a nice shot that was taken about three or four years back but um although you know there's a big family involvement there are awful lot of other people involved um not only on the staff but section leaders volunteers other other labor uh workforce we have at the show itself so yeah it's a big team effort all round, rob really yeah very much so and i and i think that lots of us feel that uh you know we become part of that extended steam family whilst um whilst the show's in action and there's Another great shot. I seem to remember that roller with a tree hanging out of it somewhere. Yeah, well, my dad purchased that roller from Ted Hines and Shaftesbury in 1968. And uh, you're right. Um, the, the, the time we brought out the steam fair was 2004 when uh, NTE did their 50 rare, rarely seen engines. And uh, so uh, dad brought the roller up complete with tree. And it caused uh, a great deal of interest, if I expect you remember that. And uh, Very much, yeah. mm. the other picture there is my little grandson, William. Um, that was taken a couple of years back. So uh, three generations, as it says. Yes. Oh, and of course, the, there's a fourth generation that, that um, was the instigator of the whole, of the whole show that uh, sadly is no longer with us. And that's your father, Michael, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, my dad was a wonderful character. Uh, there's a picture of my dad's wedding in 1955. It was a lot slimmer in those days. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, um, my dad, always interested in steam, um, grew up on a farm, lots of work in machinery. So uh, you can sort of see the, the sort of background to his fascination of steam and vintage vehicles. And um, yeah, I mean, and then obviously the trigger for the whole uh, great working of steam engines was the demise of the Somerset and Dorset Joint Railway in 1966. Okay, well, that's, that's, uh, but that's a long time away, isn't it? And uh, we can see Quo Vardis there, probably uh, the principal engine of Dorset, although I suspect Mr Pocock would contest that the little gem is more important, but we won't argue about that one, because I know that the owner's actually logged in, so I've got to be a bit careful. Uh, yes, I, I've heard Robert Coles is logged in. Good evening, Robert. Um, but uh, Quo Vardis um, goes hand in hand with the great Dorset Steam Fair uh, and my father's favourite engine, um, Quo Vadis was owned by Ted Hunter Asprey, who was one of the uh, early founders of the Great Dawson Steam Fair, along with my father and John Pocock, Richard's father, Stephen Hubbock, and a couple of others. And uh, Quo Vadis is, you know, it symbolizes the Great Dorset Steam Fair so much. It's always number one in our catalogue. Mm. Uh, my, my dad's affection with the engine 
um, grew in the 70s where he used to take it all over the country um, on a low loader promoting the great work in the steam engines at Sterapane Bushes. So um, yeah, it, it's Grove Alice and my father go hand in hand, literally. Well, it's a pretty um, <clears throat> amazing, uh, amazing event to create. But of course, uh, it wasn't the size it was then as it is now. I mean, now it's a huge event, but it would be good just to understand how the great Dorset Steam Fair got to be great, if you know what I mean. Well, I think, as with anything, um, everything's got to have a starting point, hasn't it? And um, the, the first show in 1969 followed a couple of steam parties um, uh, on the back of the, the closure of the Somerset and Dorset Joint Railway and my, my dad taking silling films and, and that being showed three times in the, the local pub, the Royal Oak at Overfit Spain. And um, yeah, the, the first show I believe, was about five acres, nothing bigger than that. And then it grew uh, over the following years, uh, 20 acres, 50, and then 100, 250, and then um, up to sort of massive proportions in the last well, 10, 15 years, 500 acres. And in fact, we actually got to 700 acres at the 50th anniversary three years back. So uh, yeah, colossal transformation in size over the years. And you've been at three sites, I think it's right to say, haven't you? Um, I think it's four, actually. What well, the first, the first three, uh, no, the first two, 69 and 70 was at um, Down M Farm at Sterapane. And then in 71, moved to the infamous Sterapane Bushes uh, uh, location um, up until 1984. And then over to Everly Hill from 85 to 87. And then up at Tarrant Hinton ever since. So we've been at Tarrant Hinton for 33 years. Incredible, really. It's a very long time, and I'm 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 a kind of a newbie to the show, not joining you until the year 2000, and I and I'm sure everybody's got their own their own memory of the first time that uh, you break hallow ground, so to speak, and and it really is quite a quite quite a vision, and it still it still hits the spot when you come round the corner, but not everything was plain sailing in the in in the in the the, the formative years of the show, was it? I mean, there must have been hard times when. Well, the weather just killed you. Well, absolutely. Um, I, I always remember my father saying in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, there were nine consecutive years of bad weather. The show was on its knees financially. And a lot of people were saying to dad, it, it's really time to give it up. You know, it's, it's, it's just not worth it. It's costing too much money. Um, father actually put the deeds of our house up to keep at the bank to keep the show going. And Doc Romani's did the same. Um, and without them doing that, um, the show wouldn't have survived into the 90s, uh, let alone today. So hats off to those guys for doing that. Very much so, because, the, you know, their commitment became, you know, everybody's gain. And obviously now it's your it's your principal you know, daily activity. I know we might only see you for a few days of the year, but I suspect <laughs> there's many, many weeks of um, of preparing the show and taking it down but <clears throat> can you give us an idea of your of, of you know a brief pricey of your of your current scenario when you're building in normal time a show? okay normal times well um considering the show should have finished yesterday we would have been on a massive pull down de-rigging now for a couple of weeks probably coming out of the show going at tarrant internet we played it up probably third week of september um two or three weeks sort of um sort of getting back into the office properly, um, sorting out paperwork, admin, paying lots of bills, unfortunately. And then probably by the end of October, we'll be uh, working on the following show. So I suppose um, really the show, about 11 months of the year, I suppose, from um, a, a time scale really um, to get it up and running, which is, um, you know, it, it's a lot to do. You know, you can imagine it's a it's an administrative um uh, I was going to say nightmare, Rob. I suppose it can be sometimes, um, but it's just a massive operation which we have to put together. You know, um, you know, we have lots of meetings with the council, police, fire ambulance, um, uh, as well as contractual obligations, uh, meetings with those guys, um, lots of dealings with the public, as you can imagine, dealings with exhibitors, section leaders, our own staff and volunteers. So pulling all that together to come to fruition at the end of August is no mean feat, really, obviously. No, certainly not. And I know that um, everything's in the same place. And uh, it's, it's, it's small wonder that with the, the jigsaw 
the ultimate jigsaw that you've got to put together through through your five or six hundred acres that what what's the starting place there must be a ground zero from where you move out from well i suppose um ground zero is probably is when we more or less put the the past show to bed really so as i say um once we sort of get into october middle of october we pretty much put the old show to bed apart from maybe a couple of council meetings whereby there's a debrief um, but also looking ahead to the following year as well um, but I'd say certainly October, November, we're really getting stuck into planning for next year. And then certainly after Christmas, um, up and through into the spring, then we are really gathering pace. And then, of course, we hit into the summer months. Then we haven't got a minute's peace. You know, we're seven days a week, flat out, working all sorts of crazy hours. But it's what we do. You know, you know, we don't complain. You know, it's, it's part of the job. You know, it's, it's how tourism is, I suppose, in lots of ways. It's no different in lots of other parts of our industry. So, so, so where does the first stake go in the ground when you're well, starting to lay out the show? Yeah, I suppose there's two things. There's the sort of year-round administration of the show, but as you say, site work, we, we get up on site probably uh, mid of July. Um, and the first job we have to do there is to cut 16 acres of, uh, of wheat with the old binder for our thrashing demonstrations. Um, that takes probably, well, it depends on the weather, I don't know, probably seven days, 10 days. And then um, probably as we hit the end of July, that, then that's when we start site work proper, really. As you say, putting the pegs in the ground, um, rival of marquees, um, electricians start coming on site, uh, water people, um, staff increases from about six to about 50 by then. And then that increases to about 300 staff by the time we get to the show itself. So yeah, loads of infrastructure coming in. Um, and, you know, we're, we're like no other, uh, Sorry, we are like other events whereby a lot of events are held on working farms. So we have to turn a working farm in, into a major show grown location. So um, there's a lot to do in less than a month, to be honest with you. But we always manage to pull it off. So, so is, your, is your fulcrum, the showman's lineup, is, there, is it all GPS or is it um, measured? Or did you start from the front gate? Because I wouldn't have a clue as to how you start to lay out that, that, that well, massive area. Area. No, GPS is not something we've written on to yet. Um, basically, we've got, I've got plans, um, other people have got plans, and basically there are measurements which we sort of collated and um, gathered over the years, and some of them are back in my dad's days. I've still got some of my dad's old plans, which I've transferred some of his measurements to my plans, and um, yeah, basically, um, I mean, a lot of the layout of the show ground is, is fairly similar each year. So that makes things easy. But having said that, when we get up there, you look at a green field of perhaps 100 acres or something, and you've got to find a starting point and get to where you want to be. But there are a couple of locations on site where I always start marking out. And um, there's a couple of telegraph poles in the hedge, which we, which we use for floodlights and things like that. So unless the farmer starts taking them down without us knowing, then I've always got a fixed location to measure from. But uh, yeah, but it's still it's still a difficult job because you've got to be very accurate. And I've learned that over the years, especially marking out the fairground rides, for example. Um, you've got to make sure, and I double check things, well, probably not double check, three three checks probably, um, to make sure there's there's gaps and rides of a certain size and so forth. And that's sort of duplicated all through the through the show brain, really. Um, you, you've got to get it right, you know, because it's no good bringing in a fairground ride 50 foot wide and he's hasn't got a 20 foot gap to next door. It's no good him being butted straight up next to the one, uh, the other one. But um, that has happened in the past, not in my time, Touchwood. Um, Dad's had a few issues like that in the past, but he managed to get around it. He always does. He talks his way out of it, probably. <laughs> <laughs> so if I want to muck you up, I've just got to ring up Robin Hooper and pay him a tenner to shift the telegraph. I think that'd be a great uh, investment. I think I'd probably notice if it was moved. Uh, the, the yeah. I particularly use as, as a sort of fixed point location. But Robin Hooper, well, he would probably move the, the telegraph pole um, for us for some other reason, for farming reasons, and probably forget to tell me, probably. But there we are. <laughs> no. But um, the, the showman's lineup, and I mean, there's a great photograph here of, uh, of Robert and your father, you know, two, two very significant people within the locality. Um, there's nowhere else that you can go and see a lineup of engines like that. It's just a huge spectacle. And every year we, we, we come to join you and lean and lean on you for our steam fix. And the lineup of the showman's in, in, in the evening is, is just phenomenal. You can't fail but to 
be impressed and to enjoy that. Well, I think, um, you know, the show was ending line is the focal point of our show. It, it certainly was probably, uh, along with the Heavy Horse Arena, my dad's favourite part of the show. But I, I suppose if I was pushed as to what his favourite part was, it would be the showman's engine line. And um, mm. as you say, particularly in the evenings, the, the whole place comes alive and the you know, smell of the steam and the coal, hot oil, fish and chips and hot dogs. It's a great, it's a great atmosphere. So, uh, but that particular picture there, that's, uh, as you say, Robert Coles and my father, that was at the 40th, sorry, it wasn't the 40th, it's the Burrow job, the Burrow Millennium Special in 2000. Um, that was a fantastic year. And, and out of all the specials we've done, I would say the Burrow year is probably in my top three. I, I, I think it was a brilliant job that was. Um, but yeah, I mean, look at all those cynic burrows there. You just wouldn't see it anywhere else. And I think when we had the 40th anniversary in 2008, I think we managed to get 12 of the 16 burrow cynics in preservations in a similar line to that, which was a fantastic achievement. Um, mm -hmm. And hats off. I mean, Robert Coles was the brainchild behind that. And uh, Thank you so much for that, Robert. I mean, he's been brilliant for our special displays, Robert, over the years. So um, if he's listening, which I think he is, thank you very much. Robert, your fee's just gone up by 100%. <laughs> what I was going to say is, I mean, your, your, your father is, um, is probably one of the most um, recognisable and well-known um, characters of the steam world. But it's probably just uh, right at this time just to pause and, and think of absent friends, of course, your father, but also all those folk who have gone on and uh, we, we sadly won't see anymore. And many of our friends we only ever see at, you know, certain rallies. And I can think of many characters, one particular one in a blue boiler suit that normally looks after a railway junction, um, who I only ever see on the heavy haulage ring. So it's a, it's a place where we meet and it's a place where we can, you know, think fondly of those that have, uh, have moved on. But your father here, I think receiving his uh, his MBE and what an achievement! You must be so proud. Well, actually, that, that was at the Transport Trust Awards in two. I beg your pardon. I'm sorry. Yeah, no worries. Um, that was up at Kew Gardens uh, or Kew Steam Museum, not Kew Gardens. Yeah, Kew Steam Museum, and that that was a nice day. That was Prince Michael of Kent, I believe, in the background there. Um, it was a very nice day, and, and Dad was well chuffed to receive that award. So, um, but but Dad was an incredible character. Um, you know, he was a larger in life character. I had a wonderful childhood growing up with dad. You can imagine him putting the steam fair together, you know, from our front room on the telephone all night, ringing up people, trying to persuade them to come. And he would, you know, dad, dad was very good with his words and um, he, he would, he could, he could encourage or persuade anybody to come to the steam fair. He just had that very persuasive way and, um, and his likable nature. Fantastic guy. I miss him a lot, obviously. Yes, and the movement as a whole, um, you know, misses him, and and it's uh, it, you know it's great just to be reminded of of him and and all that he did for what was to become the Great Dorset Steam Fair. So you know he's a, a huge, larger than life character, even though he's moved on. And this is, uh, I believe, the memorial service, was it? Yeah, it was. Uh, Dad sadly passed away in November two thousand and nine. Then, of course. The, the next steam fair uh, after that was 2010 and we had a memorial service I believe on the first morning of the show that year and um, you can see the number of people there at the service you know it's it's, it's packed which is what a, a fantastic tribute to, to dad um, and all what he's done for the for the show and the Steve movement generally yeah very much so I mean you mentioned um, that your father was very was very keen on the heavy heavy haulage uh, arena and um, I have to you know declare an interest here because I do like um, hitching up a bit of something heavy behind clinker and making making the engine bark going up over Watford Gap but that's become a um, almost an international focus isn't it? Well it is I mean if, if you want atmosphere there's there's no better place than our heavy haulage arena um, you know you, you can see at the show each year some people plant themselves down on their chair and stay there all day you know it's fantastic but I think that the heavy haulage arena sums up um, the, 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 the whole uh, formula of the steam fair and dad's ethos of a working event. You've got engines in there really pulling themselves, not to pieces, but getting that way, you know, um, and certain owners, you know, they, they, they really don't mind putting themselves on big loads and putting the engines through their paces. And, you know, that working theme is exactly what dad liked to see 
and, and it's what brings people back year in, year out. And it's the same for other sections like thrashing wood soaring, showman's engines uh, doing their bits as well. Plus all the adventures machine you have at the show, working tractors, the heavy horses. It's that working theme which Dad, you know, he, he saw was a winner. And um, it's still central to what we do now. It has to be. Well, I believe that the that the heavy haulage um, spectacle started at Stour Pain, didn't it? It did, um, but it really came to light um, down the next uh, location at Everly Hill. Um, there was a, a side road um, up alongside the Everly Hill site, and that, that was where what became Amalgamated Heavy Haulage was formed. Um, and they used to come up that side road, you know, County Council Highway, um, really giving it some, and um, how, how they ever got away with it, with the council, I don't know. I mean, I, I couldn't see we'd get away with it today. It's a narrow road, you know, blind corners and that, but um, fabulous it was watching that. I remember when I was growing up, brilliant stuff. Yes, I mean, it's, um, I, I, again, it's, when, when I first came to your show, <clears throat> looking to, to buy a Ransom Sims and Jeffries uh, engine that was in the ownership of uh, the late lamented John Vincent, who was a lovely character. Mm. Um, I, I sat at the side of the ring and gazed in, <clears throat> wondering if I might ever actually get access to the ring, and it was probably never going to happen. And and when we bought um, bought our bar, you were kind enough to allow us to come in and uh, have a play. And it's and it really is a spectacle. I mean, it's a, it's just a phenomenal. It's it's a chance where you can go back to the playground and get your conkers out and have a good laugh. If you Absolutely. I might use that analogy. Uh, without offending, but it's it's somewhere where you can actually you can you can carry out some haulage. But there's also been you know a couple of quite recent um, big haulage events that you've uh, initiated, being the 2014 and the 2018 uh, centenaries of the start and the conclusion of the First World War. So those were um, very well, they were marvelous events, spectacular. Absolutely. And um, as, as you know, we have done road runs in the past, but um, um, that certainly culminated, I think, probably the 2018 one was absolutely incredible with the, the number of vehicles involved. I mean, um, your own engine was on the front of the road train, wasn't it? Um, it, it was a brilliant day. I mean, I think the weather was not so clever. What was that 14? I can't remember now, to be honest. Probably both. Um, but um, yeah, it was absolutely brilliant. And then when, when um, it stopped in the centre of Blanford and caused complete chaos for a couple of hours, that was even better. You know, it, it, it was just a, what my dad would have loved to have done. Um, we, we really shouldn't have stopped in Blanford, but um, I think needs must and we had to do it. You know, and um, I, we, I think we had buses turning around, people getting upset in their cars. But, um, you know, it, 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 it had to be done and um, it, was, it was a tremendous spectacle and the memory will live forevermore. I think that was a brilliant thing. I think absolutely, and it was uh, it, it was a tribute to all of the authorities and yourself um, in in managing to get you know consent to be able to do this. And whilst there, you know, I'm sure there was a bit of traffic issue, and you mentioned the clogging up of Blankford. Um, I didn't hear anything but kind of praise for for the the spectacle that you managed to deliver. And certainly from my point of view, when I I had a phenomenal time, my son and I. We're, we're looking after our engine. It's something that uh, I very, very much doubt will, I will have the pleasure of doing once more in my life. So it was a, it was a great event. I just it wanted was, to... Uh, I have to give thanks to Dave Allen, who was the, the brainchild behind the negotiations with a lot of the engine owners on that day, and also for us to begin the procession or the run from uh, Bobbington Tank Museum. Um, you know, so, yeah, without Dave's input there, that, that wouldn't have happened. So... Um, Dave, if you're watching, again, thank you very much for all your help over the years. Um, and the other road run which uh, comes to mind, um, as well as the 2014 uh, World War One run, was the one in 2011 when the Searle family bought the big trailer back from Horsham all the way down to Dorset. That, that was good as well. Um, mm. So um, Yeah, all in all, we've had some good road runs outside the showground, so, which is all good for PR, absolutely. Yeah, well, I suppose I ought to personally thank Dave, Dave Allen for finding a pair of trousers I could get into, <laughs> <laughs> which I think was more of a challenge than he cared to admit. But, well, um, you know, <laughs> I sacked my tailor after that, you know. But, uh, 
There you go. Well, but the you know we we naturally focus on steam as uh, as the natural traction engine trust, and here you can see the the the, the marquee where the trust has its uh, its its exhibition and displays and and really kind of um, in, interfaces with uh, all the folks that come down to the steam fair, and it's the National Traction Engine Trust has always been. Um, a part of the Great Dorset Steam Fair and and exhibiting because I, I feel that um, you know the national a national event such as yourself and the National uh, Traction Engine Trust they sit pretty well hand in hand. We both have common aims and views. I would have thought. Hundred percent. I couldn't agree more. You know, um, we, we've had a long-standing relationship with with the NTET, and um, as you say, that works both ways. And um, you know, we've been very supportive of you, and you've been very supportive of us, and um, and and long way that continue. You, you do a wonderful job um, for our movement behind the scenes. You know, fighting the the legislation which uh, comes our way, your way, um, and um, no, I, I've got nothing but you know thanks and praise for what you guys do. You know, you're doing a, a sterling job, and things would be much more difficult without um, you fighting our cause behind the scenes. That's for sure, Rob. That's not a problem, Martin. Your your views will be reflected in our invoice. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not joking. Um, Just saying. <laughs> the only time I can get one up on you. No. Um, I, I think um, there's a great photograph here, and I think just just sliding slightly sideways. And if I might just just think of, of the trust. I mean, our future, and that's really what we're talking about: the ability of the trust to to ensure that we can continue to to uh, have our engines on the road, have coal to burn, but we've also got to have people to drive them. And if you don't have succession planning, you don't have a future, you're not sustainable. And the trust is, is uh, I'm very keen uh, on encouraging young people to, to join and learn about steam traction. And I, I'm a, a member of another, another club which is uh, involved with internal should i say infernal combustion and um the the average age is is, is well over 70 and there are a relatively few young people who are coming through so just a time to celebrate the the fact that our 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 hobby our interest passion is, is very much alive because we have so many young people coming into the movement and it's really important for us but also for for the for, for you as well Hundred percent, you know, and, and um, the Steam Friends of Club, you know, it's so important for the future. There's no two ways about it, and um, we're very pleased. I think on the Friday nights of the Steam Fair or the Friday itself, um, we it's it's Steam Prentice Day, so they have a chance to get in the ring and get out close to the big engines and things, which is which is great. And um, you know, we're more, more than happy to continue that in, in, in every which way we can. Um, but. Um, just, you know, with, with the younger element anyway, you know, it, it, it's important for all sections of the show to encourage youngsters to come through. You know, it, it is, whether your dad's got a tractor, a station engine or, or whatever, a vintage car. Um, it, it's important that we have the next generation coming through. And that also applies, I suppose, to staff who work at the show. We need people who, who've got interest, they're volunteers. We've got to keep coming through, um, bring, bring as many youngsters as we can because the future depends on it, doesn't it? So um, I'm all for it, 100. percent Yeah, very much so. And uh, and um, something that um, I've been involved with for the last uh, five or six years is the the charity runs, charity rides around the around the showground, and um, it, it's a great time. And I think that um, the engine men have really bought into the idea that that they can help raise money through your generosity and, and providing the coal. For um, for chosen charities uh, within the locality and perhaps nationally, and I think it's uh, it, it's really glued them glued them together and uh, a common aim. And it's lovely to be able to to uh, participate in something that's going to be putting something back into the locality. Excuse me, Rob. That's all right. No problem. I'll talk amongst myself. I'm very good at that. Andrew Semple and I talked absolute rubbish for right. I should have I should have turned my phone off. <laughs> Look, that's, <laughs> it goes to live, doesn't it? <laughs> no problem. No, no, I was just, just talking about Sorry the charity about rights and, and, and just how nice it is to be able to put something back into the community. Yeah, definitely. The, the charity trailer rides, um, you know, they're, they're such a, a great thing, you know, and um, it, it's our little bit 
of, of, of giving back to the community, you know, because we not only um, are a big event, but we do cause, you know, a lot of um, hassle um, locally when the show's on, lots of traffic issues and things like that. But um, so we don't always get the good press um, with regard to, you know, traffic jams and so forth. But the charity trailer rides has certainly enabled us to get some good PR, no doubt about it. And um, and also the engine owners that they love love being on the engine with the, the, the guy the folks in the back, don't they? And um, and and to see the smiling faces of the passengers as well. You know, getting that close and personal with the engines in the Hornage Arena is is, is something brilliant. And um, they can really get a feel of of uh, of what steam engines do. Um, obviously, um, that wouldn't happen without the great help and assistance of. Uh, Louise Hall and Richard Pocock, I mean, that they've taken that job on now and have done it for several years. So, um, you know, it, it's all part of what we do at the Dorset Steam Fair. Again, a team effort. So um, long may it continue. Very much so. And, and uh, I, I think one of the best sights is to see the, the, the infamous um, Lord Wakeham, Lord John Wakeham of, of Lanson, who is seen getting up on the back of the trailer, giving away pieces of memory in the shapes of coal to the young people. Yeah. Oh, cool. oh, and then showing the exits and how to get out it never fails to make the whole the whole trailer ride just I, collapse I uh, so where thank I you are. john if you're here uh, uh my account follows soon but no no it, it is good. Went, <laughs> yeah well you know it's uh it's only small laps martin don't worry okay um but <clears throat> i wanted to move on to and we've talked a lot about this about the steam part of your of your show, but that's really quite a small element, isn't it? When you compare well, with all the, the other issues that you're you're managing and, and the different exhibits. Yeah, I suppose exhibit wise, the exhibit numbers that the Steam section is probably um, comparable to other sections. But of course, you know, Steam Steam is central to what we we are. We're based on Steam, and as our name suggests, it, um, we're a Steam event. But um, we're much more than just steam as well. You know, we've got a whole vintage display. Um, we've got basically a country show there as well with heavy horses, rural crafts, um, classic cars, um, you know, much like other events have, but we've probably just got more, more of it really. And, um, and we try and get as many of our exhibits to demonstrate in the way in which they were built all those years ago. And um, yeah, I think the steam fair, it's just got that sort of festival atmosphere whereby um, it just creates um, that wonderful feeling of excitement and, the, you know, the sights and smells. And I think um, there's nowhere else quite like it in that way. I, I think you're absolutely right. But I think we, um, I know I hear some, some folks say, well, you know, we don't want the rest of this stuff around. But really, actually, it's, it's all the other exhibits that bring in the people that allow you to make the show work, that allows us to bring our engines and, and play. It's, it has to be a balance, doesn't it? You need those guys, families, <clears throat> excuse me, coming through the gate, bringing in the money so that you can put the show on because it's a very expensive event. Well, it, it is. Yeah. My, my father always used to say it has to be a family event um, and we wouldn't just survive on enthusiasts. And, um, and he is right. Um, we, we have to cater for the whole family. And, and that's why since the very start of the event, there's always been tray stands at the show, rural crafts, um, because that tends to attract to the ladies, whereas the more mechanical side of things attracts the gents, um, as, as this picture shows, you know. So um, we have to have that balance throughout the showground to appeal to everybody and, and also the kids, you know. Um, we have to have um, uh, things there which appeal to the children and that's why we have fairground rides. And in more recent years, we've had obviously a stunt arena with monster trucks and various stunt artists displaying what they do and um you know it hasn't always gone down well with the sort of um the, the perhaps some of the older generation but as as i often say just look around the arena stunt arena when things are happening down there it, it's packed and if we can get people to the show um in any which way the chances are that they're going to be happy to come again and we want to come again and that's that's our lifeblood really people and um, without their input and them attending, then, as you say, the show wouldn't wouldn't be cost effective. And also, I, mean, I know back in well, back in the day, my dad used to be heavily criticised for the number of catering vans he had at the show and the number of trade stands. But as as you alluded to just now, Rob, you know, without the, the financials which these guys bring in, the rentals, then there isn't the money there to put the event on. And 
you know, without the event being sustainable, there is no event. And, and that still holds true now. I think it's probably worth just um, just mentioning the, you know, the fifth, the, the big event that, that, that went rather wrong with traffic management and lose and everything and was up in arms. But the next event was was a total transformation. Uh, you must have worked incredibly hard and, and learned from from the judgment calls that you made within the very best of reasons. It, it, it's a living event. And I think the change from, from that, that kind of problematic show through to the next one, which ran so smoothly, was a credit to you reacting to the issues that you have to manage. Well, thank you. Um, I mean, going back to the 2018 show, the 50th, um, it, it's sort of bittersweet for me. I mean, the show as a spectacle was fantastic with the world record display of engines. Um, I don't think that's ever going to be repeated. So from an exhibit viewpoint, it was a fabulous event. But um, as you as you say, the, we did have enormous problems behind the scenes with uh, traffic and toilet. And um, uh, hindsight's a wonderful thing. You know, what we did before the 50th, because we knew it was going to be a big and busy show, we, we changed contractors with regard to those two elements. And um, we so-called brought in two of the biggest players in the country to look after our toilets and, and traffic management. But unfortunately, they didn't perform at all. And uh, it caused us massive problems with traffic delays and, and so forth. And toilets weren't kept clean enough, um, which was a great shame on our very special year that we had issues behind the scenes. But, you know, it happened. Um, you know, we, we took those decisions at the time in good faith. But um, unfortunately, we ended up with egg on our face with those two problems. But um, it is what it is. And, um, you know, we had to hold our hands up and say we, we got it wrong. We, we definitely should have stuck with our tried and tested contractors. And um, we, we certainly had to, um, you know, go cap in hand to them the following year and say, can you come back? And they did. And as you say, in 2019, those problems were rectified and we got back on track. But um, there's no doubt that those problems in 18 didn't do us any favours. It hurt us and it, it, it kept people away the following year. But I think we proved that we could deliver um, and get it right. And um, so that bodes, bodes good for us for the next show, hopefully next year. Well, I suspect the, uh, the old plate full of humble pie helped the waistband, Martin. Absolutely. <laughs> doesn't, do, doesn't hurt to have a bit of humble pie now and then. No, no, my, no, my waistband <laughs> tells me I, sh I should be on a permanent <laughs> diet. <laughs> but then I've always been modest, haven't I? You know there that. You yeah. um, there's some... Um, the 1940, you know, the, the, the World War I um, uh, trenches that you, that you put up were really only designed to be there for the duration of the four years of the, of the Great War, but um, you've kept them on. What was the logic behind that? Well, actually, originally, uh, when we did it in 14, um, we didn't know whether it was going to go past the first year because um, it was perhaps thought to be a one-off, but... Um, Certainly uh, at 14, we thought, as you say, we would probably take it through to the uh, end of the four years, which we, which we did. And then um, after the 18 show, which was the 50th, um, we, we sort of made the decision that we would actually, you know, that would be it. We'd push them in and, and um, that would be a, a part of the history of the show. But we had such a public, um, I don't know, uproar, I suppose it was uproar, that we should keep them because there's such a fantastic set in the show that we thought, actually, um, you're right. We, we should keep them because, you know, as part of our heritage and history, it's important that we continue to display, you know, these these fantastic um, uh, commemorations because it's it's important. It's right up our street as a show, really. So why, would you, why should we get rid of them? So we, we have decided to keep them and um, indefinitely, I think, now. And they are a fantastic part of the show. Um, and when you think they were put together um, originally in 14, um, in a matter of three weeks with a couple of JCBs and bits and pieces, you know, it's, it's incredible. But, you know, I, I certainly can't take the, the, the credit for that, really. I mean, it's Roly Moore's, um, who's our World War One section leader. I mean, he's the brainchild behind it and um, lived down here at Bridport. And um, he's such a nice guy and relaxed. And, you know, he, he, what he doesn't know about the First World War is not worth knowing. You know, he's incredibly um, knowledgeable about it. And he's... He, he goes to France quite a bit and often comes back with another truck he's found in an old barn. You know, it's incredible. So, but the section really has, has been spectacular, I have to say, and it's so authentic, especially with the um, uh, living historians, which accompany 
the trenches and of course the vehicles. So yeah, it's a great display overall, yes. And it's uh, it's somewhat spooky and eerie that, that immediately behind your trenches are the, the marks and the telltales of the training trenches of Blandford Camp. And I'm sure that everybody knows that, but it is quite, quite, quite eerie that they, the, the, the real thing sits behind. It, your, it is, isn't it? Isn't it uh, such a coincidence, isn't it? You know, and it's almost like written in the stars, isn't it? So, in some way, it's yes, very much so. Yeah, very much. Uh, so. Yeah, very strange, but uh, nice at the same time. Yeah, and it's um, there was a photograph just a couple of slides back of a young lad on a on a miniature engine, whose whose uh, whose mum has now joined us as a trustee, and young Oliver um, was beside the the ring, leaning and looking at looking kind of with great envy as to how he might kind of get involved with engines. And I, I walked up to him and said, do you like steam engines? And he nodded. And I yeah. said to his mum, would you like to go? And, and that was that was the end of it. And uh, Oliver will, I'm sure, play with steam for the rest of his life. So to Louise, I'm sorry about that, my dear, but Oliver, I'm sure, will benefit from the exposure of steam. And thank you for what you do for us in the trust. Just a little... Uh, a little, you know, anecdote, but it it, it is funny how uh, and and very potent, and and it's worthy of remembering that that we are we are there and we interface with the public and and it's almost our our our, our duty to engage and to help those people that are interested come forward. And I suspect that happens with all all of the the shows and the events, um, and the the sections of your of, of your display. Definitely, yes. Yeah, very much so. So. You have you've had you've had a few special years, haven't you? I remember the Burrell year was there, but I think that the yeah. one that was perhaps the most spectacular or, or the most great it was the roller year because that was the chat when all you know all, all the lads could bring get the rollers in and, and and they were chuffed to bits. It was it was a lovely spectacle. It really was. That was two thousand and thirteen, um, which is eight years ago now. Incredible, but um, yeah, that was a brilliant year, absolutely brilliant, and. Um, I would say that's probably right up there with as, as good a special we've done, really. Um, fabulous. I think we had, I can't remember now, 130, 140 rollers of all shapes and sizes there. And um, it, it was a brilliant section. And um, I must applaud Mr. Wakeham on this one, particularly, because... I don't think there's any need to do that, you know. Okay. I'll, 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 enough okay. to do. <laughs> but um, his sort of um, professional skills came to the fore there, really, because... Um, came up here with, with Robert Coles and uh, Michael Gopes um, from the Road Roller Association come down several times for meetings here in the spring and summertime. And John being involved with our specials was there as well. And um, John, um, as often the case with the specials these days, took a leading hand in the layout of where the engines go. And um, you know, particularly you know, attention to details of map, not like my old plans, which are a bit like that, if you can see, I don't know, but anyway. Um, but um, yeah, and then when we got on site, there's John out there with his string and basically slide rules and measured two, two sets of lines of rollers going down the hill past the NTE tent. And the, the pegs came out, numbered up beautifully, painted and all like arrowed up. Fantastic. And, and, and out of all the, the memories of the roller special is those two lines of rollers going down either side with the avenue between which sticks in my mind. And um, John actually marked them out brilliantly. It, it looked a spectacular 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 uh, display so um yeah that that was that was brilliant but you know that the the rotors themselves you know the different various makes and the different models and classes of each rotor it was un unbelievable really so yeah it was great year i'm very pleased to report that his uh, his skillet lining up gin at six and seven o'clock in the evening <laughs> the top of the heavy haulage ring is 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 exceptionally good as well and so i'm very good. happy and pleased to help him with that so. Yeah, I'll bet. <laughs> no, it's it's um, you know, from my point of view, sitting quietly after a bit of supper, you sat in a in in, in a fold up chair, looking down when the dark has come and the noise of the fair, the lights and and everything going on and the music playing. It's actually it's probably worth talking about that. I mean, it's quite an event you you hold really from from a music and a and a, and a beer festival point of view. Well, it is. Um, I mean, beer tent has always been part of the steam fair. And um, that, that sort of um, brings in my memory. Um, I don't know if whether you're aware, you probably are, that um, my father and John Carter, Joby's dad, they had a debate 
well, many, many years ago, about whether beer tents um, and steam rallies should go hand in hand. Well, my dad said yes, and John Carter said no. And there's a tape of that conversation. I think it was at a public forum somewhere up in Oxford, I think. Um, that If you ever get a chance to listen to that, um, you ought to. But my dad um, actually put a very good case that um, beer tents and steam rallies had to go hand in hand. And, and I think he's right, to be, to, to be honest. Um, you know, um, I, I could not imagine the, the, the Great Dorset Steam Fair without beer tents, alcohol, you know, real ales, cider shack, as we were talking earlier about. Um, you know, because um, at the end of the day, the, the Great Dorset Steam Fair, like any event, it's, it, it's entertainment. We're in the entertainment business. And people, if they've been on, you know, exhibiting all day or walking around all day, they want to have a few beers in the evening, let their hair down, and that's what it's all about. And obviously that goes hand in hand with music. And, um, you know, although we've had music at the show before, I have to say that the music side of things have, has increased in the last sort of five or 10 years. We have a big outdoor stage now, but it's what people want, you know. Um, and the fact that we've got five or six different music areas at the show, it, it caters for all tastes. So, you know, if you want to go and see Busker in the in the real world tent, you can. He's on three nights if you don't want to see him. Go and watch something else in the Michael Oliver tent uh, or the outdoor stage. So. Um, I, th I think it's fundamental to what we do now, you know, um, without it, I think it would be a shallow, shallow event in the evenings, definitely. Very much so. I mean, during your time in running the show, have there been any kind of amusing situations you can think of? I'm sorry to put you on the spot. I should have asked you this well, earlier, so you could have thought about well, it. But... Yeah, you put me on the spot. But no, um, yes, um, some of them I can't repeat, obviously. but uh, Of course not, as a gentleman. Um, woman. Absolutely, as a gentleman, with, you know, I've had I've had some funny stories and I've seen some funny things. And um, I, I remember, um, well, we, we had a caravan pinched. Oh, this is going back about fifteen years back. Um, um, we had a caravan ended up in Blandford um, being pinched overnight, and it, it got stopped by the police. And the reason it got stopped because the awning had been sort of carved off about two feet from the rim of the caravan. And um, there was a, a, a lady inside who was, was completely startled and wondered what was happening. So she had been dragged off the site and woke up in the middle of Blandford with her, three quarters of her awning missing. So that, that was quite an amusing story. Not for her, I don't suppose, but for all us, we had a bit of a giggle behind the scenes. But um, yeah, we've had some, we've had a few pranks and even the staff in the office, you know, we, we have some fun. Like you were saying, you had a gin at the end of the day. We, we have a beer or two in the office in the evenings. Well, why not? You know, it's, it, it, we're there to try as well as we're there to sort of work and, and manage the show. We, we also try to enjoy ourselves as well because, um, you know, it's only on once a year and we don't want to miss it, obviously. But um, yeah, there, there are some funny stories. And um, and I think, you know, the characters make the, the funny stories, don't they? And I, I, I don't think I've ever been to anywhere where there's so many different range of characters than the Steam Fair. You know, it brings a lot of people together and, um, you know, the fun and laughter, which we all have up there is is probably, you know, um, I wouldn't say second to none, but as good as anywhere, I think. I, I certainly think it is. And I think part of the um, part of the skill that you have to manage is, you know, I love the uh, the quiet way at which Lorik, you know, wanders around quietly. <laughs> um, just managing your health and safety within the, the heavy haulage arena and and mm -hmm. all of your staff. I mean, you're really worthwhile mentioning. There are people that have that have that have been with you for many years section leaders come up from the top when I mean, we know we've got a a new heavy haulage um management system in place now as uh david and bert have retired but that the, they're, they're very important cogs in your wheel aren't they well they are i mean um you know the steam fair fundamentally you know we manage the 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 show itself from the office uh our main office for the year but of course um, and, that, and that looks after the, the, the you know, the, 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 the nuts and bolts of this show, really. And, oh, and we look after the steam side and the trade stands and things. But the other sections, the non-steam sections, um, are looked after, as you say, by section leaders and their, their, their volunteer roles. And they do a certain job behind the scenes, you know. They, they source and deal with their own exhibitors with entry forms and passes and everything and so forth. Um, so they do a brilliant job because, you know, without them doing that job, then we haven't got a show, you know. So, um, and it's no mean feat to look after 120, 150 exhibits because, um, you know, um, it, 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 as, as we said just now, there are all different types of people you have to get involved with. 
And um, yeah, they do a brilliant job. And, and that's backed up by their assistant section leaders and volunteers. So yeah, it, as I said previously, it's a big team effort. Yeah, very much so. It's a, very much so. I mean, I, I can't begin to think of the of, of the, the scale and the, and the problems that go with bringing a show together. And uh, if you don't get it right, you get, you know, you get ripped to pieces. But, you know, thankfully for all of us, you know, you do get it right. But so we've talked about where the shows, you know, come from, how it, how it started and, and the journey and all the idiosyncrasies of, of managing it and the trials and tribulations of, you know, it's, it's, it's all or nothing, isn't it? It's either dust everywhere or, or you've got that lovely mud that manages to stick to everything. That's a gorgeous photograph of the rollers there, isn't it? But isn't it? That, yeah, like, yeah. That's there's the wrong year on that. It's too, too, that's probably my my. I sent that to Naomi. Probably the wrong caption on it, but it's 2013. But that is the roller special. That was a fabulous photograph, wasn't it? Mm, very um, much so. Yeah. But I, I think that um, that, that all of us, and um, well, certainly I can speak for myself, we've we've really missed our our our, our year events and, and where they come and especially you know the great Dorset Stink Fair and I think not having who would have who could have written in history and taken a book on the Dorset Stink Fair not happening for two consecutive years I mean that's that's pretty horrendous in in our in our year but for you it must have been awful I mean how do you cope with that well um as you say no one's seen the pandemic coming and um you, you just couldn't envisage this happening, you know, after the last show in 2019, we were so looking forward to, to the 2020 show, the Foden special, we were going to um, get organised. And then, of course, March 20, um, everything got turned upside down and uh, here we are. So, but yes, for us um, and our industry, tourism, leisure itself, um, I don't think there's been a sector which has been hit as badly as our sector. Um, because basically we depend on people to get them together and without being able to do that, then, then we can't function. So yes, so we, we've had to cancel the last two shows, which for us is, is bad news. Of course it is. Um, basically we haven't traded for two years and, and that's not good for any company, but luckily, you know, we've had the resources from, from the better years to keep us going. And we've been fortunate to be awarded a, a grant from the Culture Recovery Fund for Heritage, which, which, which was very welcome. So putting all those together, um, we're, we're still here, we're still ready to go for next year. Um, but having said all that, you know, the Great Doors of Steam Fair does cost an enormous amount of money to run when, when the event is held, obviously. I mean, the last event was close on three million pounds to run. That's an awful lot of money to take um, when you're relying on basically five days of good weather. And, um, you know, so, the industry is high risk anyway, um, let alone COVID on top. So, um, you know, we're, we're used to dealing with risk, um, but um, COVID certainly put a completely different angle on things. And, um, you know, people often ask or will say to me, you know, how long do you think the steam fair will keep going? And I said, well, it will keep going as long as it's popular and, and as long as it can sustain itself financially. And, um, you know, there, there, there are always concerns about the financials because, you know, our costs over the last 10 years have probably been going up 100,000 a year. Um, and that's probably down 95% to direct legislation, licensing, health and safety rules and risks, uh, risk assessments and so forth. And us having to be more fully, more compliant, more certified. Um, and all those things cost an awful lot of money. So, you know, sustainability is something which we're always striving to, to, to keep on top of because without it, then there's no future. So <clears throat> it's difficult. It's difficult times. And I know other events are, are, are suffering, you know, increased costs. What we're looking at for next year's show with increased costs, I'm sure there's going to be some with contractors themselves not being able to work for two years. So, yeah, we've got a lot, to, lot of discussions to do as we move through the next few months. But, um, yeah, we're hoping to run next year. And um, that's that's the aim. So, I mean, I, ha I have to ask you, I mean, that there's always rumour going around that it's being turned into this or being turned into that. Oh, there's my uh, my gin mate, John Wakeham, next to your team. Absolutely, um, yes. So, I know that you, I think you've, you've got your family involved, as we saw in one of the first photographs around. So, you know, it, it, the Great Dorset Steam Fair is, is here to stay, we hope. Definitely. Um, we, we've got no no um, plans to to stop. 
not at all. Um, far from it. Quite the reverse, to be honest with you. Um, you know, we've got a, a, a great team behind us. You know, I've got my, my own family there. I've got three kids now, all in their twenties. Two boys and a girl. Um, they're all involved in the show in some shape or form. Um, you know, I've, I've got a great admin team behind me. Robert's daughter, Jenny Coles Duncan. She's she's my PA. She's a, brilliant. She is. And you know, not not only Jenny, but we've got a lot of great people behind the scenes. We mentioned the sets and leaders just now. So, um, you know, as long as we can keep the management of the company strong, then I can't see any reason why the show won't continue for many years to come. Uh, um, as I say, is in, in further legislation and the costs associated with it. That's that's going to be the problem, I think, moving forward for our industry generally, you know. Um, and for us at the Great Dorset, being a major size event, um, you know, the local authority, you know, we are watched and monitored close, very closely. And I'm not against that, but it just means that, you know, um, we, we, we have to do everything completely by the book, um, which is fair enough. But um, it, it means there's a lot more costs involved in everything we have to do. So it, 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 we live in different times now. I don't know what my dad would have, how he would have tackled things these days. Um, back in his days, he would get told what to do by the council and not bother half the time. But you could get away with that in the 70s and 80s, couldn't you? But um, you certainly wouldn't get away with it now. No, so, so you know, if I had to get you to write a postcard from the future, you know, from the Great Dorset Steam Fair in, in 2030, where, where, where does your planning think you might end up? Um, well, I, I think the show will um, still keep its central core. Um, there'll probably be some further variations as we move along over the years, but steam and, and vintage machinery, heritage will, will always be our, our main theme, our main core. Um, it's what we are, it's what people love. Um, so if, but if we can refine things as we move over the next few years, then, then great. Um, with regard to the management of the show, um, I'm 58 next month, so I'm not looking too bad, I know. But... Um, 58. So, you know, um, I'm not going to go on forever. Um, I always want to be involved, but, um, you know, I've been MD now for 20 years, um, incredibly. Um, took on from dad in 2001, um, although he was obviously still behind the scenes. So, um, yeah, there will be a time whereby it, it will be time for other people to step up to, to the plate, really. It's how it should be. And, uh, and as we alluded to just now about the Steam Apprentice Club, you have to bring the next generation through um, because if you don't, then there's going to be problems. So, um, yeah. So over the next three or four years, I'm looking to, you know, bring up more of the team, more of the family into the fray. Um, not necessarily family, but people who can do the job. Yeah, basically, it doesn't matter. You know, if they're up to it, let's get them in and get them doing it. You know, that's the main thing, isn't it? It's very much the case. I mean, uh, my son's involved in our business. And, Absolutely. Um, and it's, it's very important and I, I'm, not, I'm now getting in the way. So, you know, it's time for me to move out, go out to grass. But just, I've, there's, a last, there's a last slide I just, that, that people might want to just um, taste. And, that, and that's the, the, some of the stats that are involved with your show, you know, the, the number of trade stands and, and just the size and the volume of, of what you deal with, not least of all, perhaps in affluent. Well, we do get rid of uh, a lot of, uh, I, I was, I nearly swore then, but I won't, but <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> and that's probably mainly due to um, a lot of the beer being drunk at the show, probably. probably. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, some of the stats are incredible, really, you know, in look at that one there, 200 tonnes of rubbish you take them each year, 1,000 barrels of beer. Um, I think that's probably underestimated, probably more than that now, I would have thought. But um, yeah, I mean, you know, um, even most years we use over 200 tons of steam coal. Um, you know, and, you know, and the co what's the cost of that going to be next year? You know, with with the issues over the coal, that's another subject we haven't talked about yet. Probably don't want to. Um, well, no, no, we can talk about that. Um, the yeah, the coal. We're very fortunate to have some. Um, the steam movement has some some influential friends in 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 high places, and uh, um, there's been lots of uh, lobbying. Within, within Whitehall, and, and we're, we're reasonably confident that there will be uh, the future for the burning of heritage coal, but we're very confident in that, and we're hoping that, that if we're lucky, legislation coming out of Whitehall will reflect that uh, wish of government to ensure that heritage 
um, heretic um, of all types can continue to burn coal. Now, where coal is going to come from in the future, we don't know. Um, probably from far afield, maybe Russia or Brazil. That's rather a strange thought when you think that we've got great fossil fran just across the border into Wales. But I guess that wherever coal is mined is where the carbon the, the carbon uh, tax goes. So probably in government's mind, it's, it's nice to farm it out to somewhere else. But we've also got um, e-coal, 50% olive husks bound with um, ground coal has been tried with a, a, a reasonable success in a 15 inch railway. And it's uh, been likened to both in cost by the pallet and also in heat generation, very similar to Fossi Fran. So we as a movement and uh, you as one of, the, one of the providers of coal, we've got to look to the future and we've got to bite that, 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 that kind of problem and hit it head on and say, we need to do our bit to help um, the environment and to keep, to keep things on the road, literally, and in your fields. 100%. Well said. Um, you know, because I know the last few years, the, the, the issue of coal has been a major worry for all of us, hasn't it? So uh, it certainly looks like, you know, that's that's turning into or well, turn the corner now into a fable situation. So that's very pleasing to hear. So well done. Yeah, we, we've got some, you know, there's some people that uh, um, I think uh, my president's going to join us in a minute, just because, you know, I, I can't keep him out. You know what he's like. He's probably missing his strawberries and cream and duck wraps that he normally manages to get from your uh, from one of your storeholders in the back. Speak of the devil, there but no, it, it, it's important that we do, you know, move forward very much. So. Definitely, hundred percent. Yes, yeah. Andrew, are you with us, or are you thinking about it? He'll be there directly. I think that's the Cornish phrase for a non-urgent <laughs> manana. But uh, there, there he is. Look at that. Yeah. <coughs> Look at that. Oh, yeah, well, Andrew. Technology is amazing, isn't it? <laughs> yes, Andrew. Uh, I, yeah, thank you for joining us uh, as our president. Um, you know, it's really important that uh, that you join with us to you know talk with Martin and just uh, have you ha have your ten penny worth, lad. <laughs> That's very kind of you, Rob. I, I think you two chaps have uh, have done very well, actually. Uh, I don't know how long the rehearsals took, but um, there we are. Oh, yeah. weeks, Andrew, weeks. I, yeah, I've been asked for months. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a couple of days, probably. <laughs> if it was as painful as the Steam Fair FM clips that Mr. Wing and I were doing, it'll have been hard work. Uh, they were okay. I, I listened to most of that over the weekend. I thought you did a good job again, you guys. Yeah, it was good. I didn't pay my credit card bill. I, didn't, I ran out of words, Martin. Uh, right, okay. I, I, that's not, I'm not known to run out of words, but I, I was accused by the president of not having enough. Oh dear. Wow. And Andrew, yeah. you've been down the West Country for a couple of weeks, I see on Facebook. Yes, yes. I, I went to Gillingham and Shaftesbury show yeah. uh, that Richard Pocock and Louise Hall organised a, a steam section there, and uh, there was more or less a three-line wit, really, for me to attend. Um, and uh, say a few words, which I was delighted to do because um, when I walked into Malcolm Fleet's commentary box, it was the, two, the first time I'd been in there for two years. And I thought, hell, will I ever remember anything at my age? But uh, had, had he cleaned it? Up. Had he cleaned it for you or not? Probably not. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> There's new carpet uh, tiles on the ceiling, and my own personal headset was still in its box, marked do not use, private. Wow. So everything carried on pretty much as normal. But it's, it's been great fun listening to you two tonight and, and the reminiscences. And I recall the first time we came down was about 1972-ish. Uh, Bob Bailey organised a bus from Telford and it was a petrol engine bus, uh, Bedford. Uh, and we all came down in this bus. We started in the middle of the night and eventually got to Dorset and You'll be amazed to know it was raining. Uh, and the bus <laughs> uh, anyway, we all got off the bus, put our Wellingtons back on, and eventually pushed it out of the field. And just before we got to Westbury, the bloody windscreen wipers packed up on the thing because it was still heaving with rain. So we stopped at the chip shop and got a potato to rub on the windscreen. And the bloke thought that was marvellous. Anyway, somewhere up Kidderminster Way, 
we hit a monumental puddle of water which came up round the engine, which was at the front, and, and lifted the engine cover, and a great tidal wave swept down the bus. So everybody who was fast asleep suddenly had wet feet. <laughs> My first memories of, uh, of, of Dorset, and then I remember the sign at Everly Hills your father put up. It was Paradise Farm, it was called, wasn't it? It still is, yes, indeed. This, this is Paradise, you've now arrived. Or yeah. Typ typical of your dad. <laughs> but, um, he, was, yeah. he was a great one for, for slogans and things. He was very, very, very quick with his um, thoughts on getting a good sign together. Yeah, definitely. Remember, he did lots of things like that. Yeah. And then when you started putting those statistics up at the end, I always remember his after dinner talk about how many miles of toilet roll we used. It, it went up by about 20 miles each time he did the talk, I think. But, uh, <laughs> that sounds about right. <laughs> nobody ever argued with him, but indeed, he was a great man. I, I would like to thank was. opportunity, actually. You were talking about the Steam Apprentice Club, and that's to thank all the engine owners who support it and uh, willingly take on uh, youngsters. We see a lot of that at Dorset, where um, they suddenly find themselves uh, handed a enthusiastic young polisher or whatever. And thanks to the generosity of, of many, many engine owners, we have a lot of youngsters now involved in the movement who've gone on. I mean, the first steam apprentices are now in their 50s, as Brian Allison will tell you. Um, he was one of the very first. Um, you know, so we, we've seen people come on and uh, um, we've still got this supply, which is which is great. And, and that really gives me a lot of pleasure. Definitely. Yeah, 100%. Um, yeah, very much so. Basically, endorsers are discussing earlier, Rob, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, very much so. It's, uh, it's um, we just got to look after the future and our youngsters are part of it. And, yeah. and if, if, I, if I could just kind of, you know, fly the trust flag again, it's uh, it, it's it's our it's our core focus. Apart from making sure that we continue to be able to to have our engines and to use them in the way that we've become accustomed over the years, it's to encourage young people to come and join us. And and I absolutely echo Andrew's comment. You know, thank you to the engine owners. I know it's a bit awkward when someone comes and a young lad comes with a tin of brass and it plasters it halfway across the paint and doesn't do a very good job, but you've only got to have him for half an hour or something like that, or her. And the difference that it makes to that young person's um, time to be around an engine or just to, you know what it's like, you, when you're outside something, you want to get in. And when you're in, you don't understand how, how important it is to get in from you. It, it's, it's just thank you to the engine owners. I echo that completely. Because without your gift of a little bit of time, these young people would never join us. And after all, it's those young people that want to buy our engines when we're too old to use them. So there's a little bit of you know, justification there if you need one. But Martin, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. I, I know that we've, um, you know, we've, we've met on more than a few occasions, but, but thank you very much indeed for giving up your time, uh, especially you know, when under normal circumstances, and we hope they will return soon, that you will have you would have been, you know, kind of just hanging and thinking, well, I've got that one done. But thank you very much indeed for giving your time. Not a problem, Rob. And, and you know, the feeling is completely mutual. You know, thank you very much for the invite. It's always nice to have a chat with you guys. And, um, you know, and, and for the trust to, you know, um, incorporate and, in, you know, embrace the Great Dorset Steam Fair in this way, it, 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 it's great. It's great for us. And, um, you know, because it, I think it's important not only we, we have a connection at the event, but outside the event, such as what we're doing tonight, it, it, it's great. And um, long may it continue. So thank you very much. Absolutely. And uh, if I, my final plug to, to you guys that are, that are listening, if you are a member of the National Traction Engine Trust and you would normally renew your subscription down at the Great Dorset Steam Fair, if you could find the time just to visit our website, website ntech.co.uk, and if you could renew your subscriptions, personally, I'd be really grateful because although we're not singing at the moment because there's nothing going on, there's an awful lot of work that, that trustees do. And, and I'm so proud of our team that work tirelessly behind the scenes to, 
to keep steam on the road. I know it's our strap line, but your subscription really does make a difference. So if you could find five minutes, or if you're thinking, well, I'm not sure it's important, it really is. So please do come and join us. We're working our socks off to, to be more communicative, and this particular medium is one way in which we can help to engage with our members. And if you've thought of joining the Trust and you never quite got around to it, please do revisit that because we can really do with your help and support because it's the old adage, united we stand, and well, divided we don't want to know what happens. So please do join us if you can. Martin, Andrew, and for Naomi who hides behind the NTEP badge and has done all the hard work, all I've done is waffle. Thank you very much indeed. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us at the National Traction Engine Trust webinar for the Great Dorset Steam Fair. Goodbye.